Uh, hello, this is Amritan Sharora with The Print. Today we have uh, uh, Mr. Navdeep Suri, former ambassador to Australia and seasoned diplomat with us uh, to discuss his uh, new book, A Game of Fire. Uh, sir, uh, if I may ask, uh, what uh, motivated you to translate uh, your grandfather's writings which have uh, 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 culminated in the form of this book? So, you know, my grandfather, Nanak Singh Ji, was uh, probably... Uh, the most famous writer in Punjabi language. Uh, he's widely regarded as the father of the Punjabi novel, left a huge legacy of 38 novels and some 20 other books. Um, and um, I feel that he was such a genius of a thinker and storyteller. That's a pity that his uh, influence remained limited to Punjabi language. So my motivation to translate his books uh, is really to see whether we can take these stories uh, to a wider audience. But it's not just about preserving or increasing his legacy. It's also because many of these books have a message that is relevant uh, to our times. Uh, and, and I think uh, at a time when we have been celebrating uh, India's 75 years of independence, uh, Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, uh, it's uh, important that we also remember the price that our nation paid particularly in Punjab and in Bengal, of course, uh, for that independence. And, 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 and uh, so I felt that these two books, um, A Game of Fire and uh, Hymns in Blood, um, were both published in 1948. There's a rawness, there's an immediacy, it's contemporary history being told to us through uh, novels. Um, and um, in the foreword of one of these, my grandfather says, why am I writing this book? This is more history than fiction, but I'm not a historian. But I'm writing this book because I know with the passage of time when people look back, they will be, their vision will be colored by their own biases. Uh, I want to write it as I saw it myself. And that's why these two books, I believe, are so important for us to know. Uh, Ambassador, to build on what you said, uh, in your opinion, uh, what is the need, like why is it so important for young Indians today to read, learn uh, from uh, first-hand accounts such as uh, the one that your grandfather uh, left us with? Uh, why is it so important for young Indians to learn and know more about the partition, uh, especially accounts such as these which are not... Uh, so to speak, uh, written by the victors, but rather the victims of this uh, horror that was the partition? Well, um, two reasons. I think uh, one, as the dictum is, uh, those who don't learn the lessons of history are designed, destined to repeat it, right? Uh, so we really owe it to ourselves uh, to, to learn those lessons of history. Uh, the second is, you know, what these novels tell us, uh, particularly this, this book, uh, A Game of Fire, is how quickly the situation in Amritsar in the first eight months of 1947 got out of control. How uh, the communities were trapped in an escalatory cycle of violence and counter-violence and violence and counter-violence. And partly the warning to us is a, beware of uh, leaders who try to arouse your religious passions uh, uh, and, and turn them against uh, the other. Uh, and the second lesson uh, is uh, also uh, beware sometimes of the role of media in amplifying and ex exaggerating uh, the events uh, and the role that, they pl that the media can play in fanning the uh, flames of passion uh, in, in these situations. And I think those messages are pretty relevant today in the times in which we live. Um, Ambassador, my next question to you is uh, about Punjab, uh, because partition is the central theme of uh, uh, this uh, book. Uh, there uh, are these notions that uh, despite the partition, it's been uh, more than seven decades now, uh, that the feelings of uh, uh, harmony among the Punjabis in 
Pakistan's Punjab and the Punjabis in India uh, are, are still very, uh, they still feel attached to each other. There seems to be some cord between them that still joins them. Uh, uh, in your opinion, you've had a front row seat of uh, India's uh, diplomatic maneuvering for so many years now. In your opinion, uh, do, would you believe that there is a realistic possibility of the two countries cashing in on this linkage between uh, the people living in, in, in Punjab on both sides of the border to sort of resume trade or better ties? You know, the paradox is that the Punjabis committed the worst of violence and brutality on each other and yet have managed to somehow r uh, rise beyond that. Uh, and, uh, you know, each time Amritsar and Lahore historically were twin cities. Lahore was the power center, Amritsar was the commercial center. The distance between them is only 40 miles, right? There was a synergistic relationship between, uh, between them. And I think what the developments that we see the, shows perhaps that language and culture can be stronger uh, as bonds that unite than religion as a bond that as a and uh, that divides, uh, and and that's perhaps what we are witnessing. You know, I don't want to engage into too much of crystal ball gazing. Um, I'll say that in Punjab, and certainly I live in Amritsar. There's a very strong desire of the business community and the man on the street for normal trading relations to resume uh, via the Atari Waga border. Uh, and, and, and certainly even the Pakistanis will benefit from, from, from that. The issue, I think, is politics on both sides of the border, particularly on the Pakistan side in this case. One is that I think the instability that we see in the Pakistani uh, polity over the last couple of years and going forward uh, really puts us in an awkward position of not being able to start any kind of a dialogue. Um, we can hope that um, you have a certain favorable confluence of circumstances, which means that number one, in the elections next month in Pakistan, Nawaz Sharif gets elected. He has already indicated his desire for a more normal relationship with India. Um, but this time, hopefully, he will also have the army supporting him, as opposed to last time around when the army undermined his desire to have better relations with India. Uh, so that's the second point, that uh, is there a genuine change in heart within the army establishment or a change in calculus, if not a change in, of heart, that their current policies are unsustainable for Pakistan's own well-being. Um, and, and, and one hears that that kind of a re-evaluation is perhaps taking place. And the third is, um, we're going to have our own elections. And hopefully after the elections, uh, the politics will be out of the way. And we will also uh, take the view that, you know, um, there's a law of um, geography. You can choose friends, but you can't choose neighbors. Uh, and if you have a stable relationship with a neighbor, uh, it probably contributes to well-being on, on, on both sides. So yeah, um, maybe this will be a year that will, uh, will bring about a change. Let's hope for that. Uh, Ambassador, since we have you here, uh, your expertise uh, in, uh, in Middle Eastern affairs, uh, given all of what is happening, uh, I had two questions for you about uh, what's happening in Middle East right now. Uh, the first being uh, uh, the American uh, administration, the Biden administration in Washington has issued an executive order sanctioning uh, uh, some Israeli uh, settlers who uh, had uh, uh, allegedly encroached on Palestinian territory. Uh, do you think this is a sign of uh, the Biden administration's uh, frustration, a uh, growing frustration with Mr. Netanyahu? I'd love to think that, uh, but I think these are straws in the wind. Um, I think it's a case of too little, too late. 27, 28,000 Palestinians in Gaza are already dead. And um, many of them have been killed by US weapons. And so if the US is going to continue supplying advanced weaponry, artillery shells, missile parts, everything else to Israel, 
to continue its offensive and to continue to take the kind of position that the U.S. has uh, on this immediate ceasefire as manifested in their track record in the UN Security Council over the last couple of months. Uh, then uh, an executive order on a few settlers really uh, doesn't. You can say it's a signal, but even then it's a very mild and blurred uh, a signal. Uh, there's a lot more that the US can do, should do. Um, they find themselves in this uh, ridiculous bind where President Biden is the self-declared strongest friend of Israel that um, you know it's ever had in the US. And this is his own declarations. He does not like Netanyahu. Netanyahu tried his best to undermine Biden's elections. So literally Biden has to thumb his nose and deal with Israel and continue to support Israel. Um, and maybe for whatever his own legacy uh, reasons are. Uh, but it's a, it's a no-win policy. I think the Americans are getting the worst of uh, both words. Um, unfortunately, you can again see a rising tide of anti-US sentiment on the Arab street. Um, from Baghdad to uh, Cairo to Beirut to Amman to wherever. Um, the Americans are losing a lot of the goodwill that they had patiently accumulated. Uh, and, um, um, you know, it's the, for a lot of the global South, uh, the hypocrisy of U.S. moralizing when it came to Ukraine and the contrast with what they're doing in uh, Gaza has been so manifestly exposed that it'll take years for them to get that credibility back. Uh, Ambassador, my last question for you is, uh, as you mentioned, that uh, there is a uh, beacon uh, in, in, a, in a way, perhaps say, a feeling of unrest uh, among uh, citizens across the Arab world, uh, so to speak. Uh, in your opinion, we've seen this in the past when uh, uh, Mr. Yasser Arafat was uh, banished from one Arab country to the other. And uh, we, we've seen this sequence of events unfold of how uh, uh, Palestinian, uh, uh, cl the claim of, of Palestinian territory was sort of uh, used as uh, an, an umbrella term for uh, Arab countries to assert themselves without actually doing anything to help Palestinians regain or claim or lay claim uh, to, to, to what they believe is rightfully theirs. Uh, do you think that is sort of repeating itself wherein uh, with so many uh, Arab countries now in the fray, uh, do you think that this will uh, in, in, in any way uh, materialize uh, or help uh, Palestinians, uh, Palestinian civilians uh, uh, lay claim uh, to what they believe is rightfully theirs with some authority? So I think um, post the 1973 war and the Camp David agreements in 1978, um, the notion that a military solution can be um, imposed by the Arabs is out of the window. There is the reality of Israel's military superiority. And there's the reality, as we are witnessing now, also of uh, virtually unlimited U.S. support for Israel. So given those two realities, you really can't have a military solution. Recognizing that, I think in 2002, in Beirut, the uh, Arabs had put forth what is called the Arab Peace Initiative, which was really to say that if Israel goes back to the 1967 borders, uh, which means that a Palestinian state can emerge uh, as envisaged in Security Council Resolution 242, um, then Arabs collectively will be willing to make peace with Israel, recognize Israel's right to exist, take off the table one of the uh, issues that leads to so much uh, turbulence. I still think that that's the most valid plan on the table. Um, the problem is that over the last 10 years in particular, you had a 
series of elections in Israel and every government that has been elected has moved a notch further to the right. And so you have a current government which is really chock-a-block full of extreme right-wing extremists. Um, what they've done is created facts on the ground. Today, when you look at the map of the West Bank, um, it is hard to see how a viable Palestinian state can be created. There's half a million Jewish settlers living in West Bank proper. Um, the destruction of Gaza, the scale on which it has happened, uh, will render it uninhabitable for years. So what the Arabs are saying is, we're ready to support the Palestinians. And this is the message coming from Riyadh, it's a message from, coming from Abu Dhabi and from Cairo. But show us a clear and irrevocable pathway to a Palestinian state. Netanyahu has said, not happening, right? And, and that's the stalemate that you're in currently. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I think that the only way this stalemate can be uh, broken is for perhaps three things to, to happen. Number one, post the war, whenever it ends, there's a reckoning in Israel. Netanyahu is deeply unpopular. There are new elections and maybe, maybe, maybe those new elections throw up a more centrist government that is more willing to concede the Palestinians' uh, political rights. The second is a change in Palestine itself. Uh, you need a really a major um, uh, changeover, makeover in the Palestine Authority. Uh, President Mahmoud Abbas is 88. He has no credibility. He is not effective. You need a new leadership to come and show that it is representative of Palestinian aspirations and, and can deliver in terms of efficiency. You know, the PA is also considered extremely corrupt and has no credibility. The third is to have somebody perhaps like Jimmy Carter, who is willing to stake something for the cause of peace. Uh, whether that will happen post-November, you don't know. But like I said, if you don't have these three things happening together, I don't see what configuration can bring peace. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for taking out the time to speak with us at the print. Uh, we hope that uh, more and more people uh, read your latest book and uh, 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 grasp the message that you have been trying to transmit. Much.